Michael Wood. And uh, please uh, watch your cell phones. And if you tweet, use the hashtag. After this is the last session of the day. After this, just a reminder that there is a social event at the something brewery. No, no, no. What they said. Uh, <laughs> check your local listings. And you look like it. All right. Appreciate it. So there's a uh, microphone. I might try to use it here. I'm told everybody's got a fresh bag of chips, so I want to make sure you can hear me. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, so my name is Michael Wood. Uh, Twitter handle and website are WP Scholar, essentially. Um, so you can go there. So this talk is Basic Principles of Software Architecture. Um, and so I am a WordPress uh, developer at Bluehost, and I am a designer. <laughs> and uh, I know this is a dev talk. You're thinking you're in a dev talk. Uh, uh, but I'm actually not really a designer in the way you're probably thinking. Most people don't think of developers as designers. Um, and of course, I'm not talking about designing graphics or uh, you know, some sort of uh, thing like that. I'm basically talking about designing software, right? Um, so that's, uh, that's one of the big things uh, that kind of sets a good developer apart is their ability to design software as opposed to just build it, right? So that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, so this is what the standard software development lifecycle generally looks like. Uh, we start with the requirements, you know, what is it that we want to build? Uh, and then we uh, have the design process, which is how should we build it? Uh, then we would implement it, then we would QA it, and then of course we would have to maintain it. Uh, the problem is, uh, a lot of times, w at least uh, until you get to where you have a more mature process, uh, most people will just run across the top here and forget the stuff on the bottom, right? So they do the requirements, they go ahead and start building, because they obviously know the solution, and then they go on and they maintain it from there. Uh, and they've skipped the design because that eats up too much time, and they skip the quality assurance because, I mean, somebody's going to notice it, right? And then <laughs> you'll fix it. So, uh, you know, why do I need to spend my time when I can have all the site's visitors figure that out? Uh, <laughs> so that's kind of the way that, you know, normally, uh, until you get some mature processes and you start to actually put design and put QA in, into the process, you just kind of run across the top. Um, and so, of course, what that ends up uh, doing is, well, and of course, I don't know, how many people have ever been in a consultation with a client before you actually, uh, you know, matured, I guess, as a developer? And the client says, oh, this is, uh, this is something we want to do. And then you're like, OK, and this is the solution. And you know, you've already thought of the solution before uh, you've even finished hearing the requirements from the client. Um, so obviously, that's the kind of thing we want to avoid. And we want to make sure we actually design. So the focus today is specifically on that design aspect uh, and thinking about you know, what we're going to do. Uh, and of course, you can say there's a lot of things that you can design in you know, a lot of people think about software arc, uh, uh, think about software architecture from a, you know, a system standpoint in terms of, you know, I need this server and I need, you know, this load balancer and all this kind of, so we're not talking about that. We're talking about code itself. You know, how do we fit the pieces of the code together in a way that makes sense and a way that we can reuse them? <coughs> uh, so first question we have to ask ourselves is what is it the clients actually care about? Um, so obviously the client cares about cost. So if we can't keep costs at a reasonable level, they're not going to be happy. Uh, timeline is very important. If you can't deliver something within a reasonable time, uh, actually, a lot of times this can be the death of a project, right? You take too long. They, like, they just give up on you and go to a different developer, but you've already almost finished the project. Um, and then uh, effectiveness, right? So they have some sort of problem, and they need some sort of solution, but not just any solution, one that actually solves their problem in a reasonable way. And the better that it solves the problem, the better the solution is, right? Uh, so those are kind of the three big things that you would look at uh, for that. So when we're looking at how changes affect timeline and cost, uh, I think it's pretty logical when you look at it that if you make a change in the design phase before you've actually written any code, it should be fairly easy to make that adjustment. 
But then as you started writing code and maybe you've gotten halfway through uh, and they come back and they say, oh, we want to change this. Say, okay, great, we haven't shipped it, whatever, you know, we can make that change, but it's going to take a little bit more time because now you have to undo some code, maybe not as much as you would have. Um, and then you have to obviously spend that extra time on it, which obviously is going to increase the cost. But if they come after you've completely delivered the thing and they say, you know what, this isn't exactly what we had in mind. Um, so we'd really like to kind of rework the whole thing, uh, you know, not, not overdo the whole thing. We just, we just need to tweak these little pieces that, you know, have fundamental code changes that will affect everything, but I don't realize this because the client never knows those things. Um, then of course that's pretty much guaranteed to cost a whole bunch of money, be a whole lot of hassle and really throw the timeline off. Um, so obviously if we can avoid these kinds of situations, we can save the time and the money up front if we can make our changes early on in the process, which means having a good design of the system and making sure that we address all those kinds of issues and problems and really run everything by the client in a way that they understand before we start. Um, so then really we boil down to what actually makes our solutions effective, right? So how do we make sure that we meet the effective portion of the client's requirements? Um, so one, obviously we have to solve the problem, uh, but it's not just about solving their problem, it's also about making sure that what we build is actually easy to maintain. Because if we build something that costs them more money in the long run to maintain, then guess how long your uh, code is gonna stick around? Not very long. They're gonna ditch your code, move on to another developer, continue the cycle, um, and you know, not really get what they need. So it's our job to make sure that we don't just solve their problem, but we make sure that in the future that we reduce costs and make sure that we don't you know, screw them over, basically. Um, so this is a simple uh, maths problem, right? Uh, so there's no code in this uh, presentation, but there, there is maths. So basically this is a pretty cool um, formula, essentially. Um, and if, has anybody here wrote the book, read the book, Code Simplicity? Everybody should go out and buy the book, Code Simplicity. Uh, it's a really good book. Some of the stuff I'm covering today actually is from the book. Um, but this is essentially the equation of software design, right? And so all these letters mean different things. Essentially, the D on the far side is the desirability of a change or a feature, right? Um, so all of these factors over here are going to affect whether it's a good idea to actually implement a particular solution. Um, and so we have, it's kind of hard to do, I, I wish I could have, uh, I guess I could have laid it out a little better. We have a division, right? So on the top we have these two V entries and on the bottom we have these two E entries. So the V stands for value and the E stands for effort, right? So if at a basic level, value over effort is, is what would result in a desirability of a change. But it's not just uh, the value of something and the effort that we put into it. Um, the N over here stands for the value of something now, whereas the F is value of something in the future. And then the E with the I next to it here is the effort of implementation. And the M stands for effort of maintenance, right? So we can have a problem and we can solve it. And if you look at it very simplistically, you're looking at the value of what, you, what your solution offers and the effort that it takes to do it. Um, but if you look at it holistically, you're looking at the value that it offers us now, the value that it offers in the future, and the effort it takes now as well as in the future. And what you see a lot of times is as um, developers, if we don't plan ahead for the maintenance and make sure that our code is not gonna get harder to maintain over time, but actually hopefully easier, or at least not any more difficult than it already is, uh, then essentially what will happen is assuming we provide uh, value into the future, um, you know, the value would overcome the maintenance costs and what we build will be useful and have longevity. So that is the basic idea. So of course, if we don't meet that and we make, uh, we choose the easy, short, dirty solutions now, then we're gonna to have to deal with the maintenance costs later. And that's what we call technical debt. Uh, so if you ever had a credit card and you pay the minimum fees and you have 24% interest rate on your cards, you know very quickly that you will be in debt 
and uh, unless you make some changes, you will continue to be in debt. And that's exactly the way it works with software. If you don't deal with your debt, then you're going to continue to uh, have issues and essentially probably go bankrupt in the sense that your project will never see the light of day or get trashed quickly and your client will move on to somebody else. Um, so there's the law of change, which basically says that the longer your program exists, the more likely that any part of it will have to change, right? Uh, which is normal, right? Because if you have a working system, uh, you know, there are also business plans and marketing strategies that go along with this. And those things are going to evolve and change as uh, things become more or less effective. And so you have to adapt and make sure that your software goes along with those things. And if you don't uh, plan for change, then essentially you are guaranteed that you're going to be become more and more in technical debt. Um, so you want to make sure that you plan for that change. Uh, there's also the law of defect probability. So basically this is saying that the larger the change you make in a system, the more likely you are to break it or to cause some sort of defect, right? So the more code that you have to change in order to fix a bug means the more likely you are to introduce more bugs into the system. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, I have one bug and I go in to fix it and now I have two bugs, right? Um, so if you, if, you, if you plan and strategize in a way where if you have an issue, you can consolidate that the need for change to one specific area, then you reduce the chances that you will have some sort of defect as a result. Um, now, obviously, if you do quality assurance, you can catch these things, hopefully, before they get into production. But that's not what this part is. Hopefully, you went to Russell's talk and learned all about that. Um, but essentially, yeah, the law of, of defect probability, the smaller the change, the less chance for breakage. Uh, which is also, if you do go in and make a code change, uh, trying to minimize as much as you can. If you have two choices, always try to touch less code. Uh, then we have the law of simplicity. Right? So the ease of maintenance is proportional to the simplicity of its individual pieces. So the more complicated you make your code, obviously the more complex and difficult it is to maintain. Uh, that's pretty obvious. Um, but that's essentially key when you're designing a system. Right? You want to keep it as simple as possible and make it easy to understand and maintain. Uh, and understand is a very big part. Right? We spend a lot of our time when we encounter a bug and we have to go change code, well, the first thing you have to do is you have to read the code, make sure you understand what's really going on with the code, right? And if the code is difficult to understand, then it's going to take you a lot longer to figure out what's going on, which is going to take more time, more money for the client. And again, you know, it just adds to the complexity of maintaining a system. Um, but you also want to make it easy to modify. So even if it's easy to understand, if you have to change code in 15 different places, it wasn't necessarily easy to modify. And of course, then we're dealing with the law of defect probability, right? We're exposing ourselves to the chance for more defects. So ideally, we want to make our code easy to understand, not have to grok the entire system, but merely just a part of it in order to be able to modify just that part, hopefully, so that we can get in and out with the solution. Uh, and of course, we want to make sure it's easy to test. So we want to make sure that what we expose um, to the outside world is easy to interact with and make sure it works correctly. So reliability does not equal understanding. So when I say understanding, a lot of people are like, oh, yes, we need coding standards and blah, 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 so that everyone can, you know, see the code and make sure they understand it. Uh, and code standards are great. Uh, linting tools are great. All these things that help you, you know, make it nice and clean and kind of consistent is important. Uh, and of course, you know, making sure the code uh, has consistent structure and that kind of thing is important. But that's your, your coding tools don't do that for you, right? Um, so making it more readability uh, readable is not going to help anyone understand your code. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you have clear naming within your system, it is going to be self-documenting, which is going to make it easier to understand. So naming variables uh, in ways that make sense, but also help expose what's going on. 
So a lot of times if we write a conditional, right, we say, oh, if uh, number 39 is greater than uh, x, then do this, right? Well, somebody looking at that code, they say, oh, what in the world is 39 and why is it so special? Whereas if you'd name that value uh, specifically, then it would become very apparent. For example, if we said, uh, you know, uh, or let's say it was 42, the, the uh, meaning of life is greater than or something, right? <laughs> you have some sort of context into, uh, into what that conditional means, right? So making sure that you not just name your variables correctly, but you have clear and consistent ways that you name your classes, the way that you name your modules or packages, your, uh, everything should be coherent and make sense. Uh, somebody shouldn't have to learn a totally different way of working uh, when they're moving around in your code. Uh, as we said, so we're going to run through some acronyms that hopefully everybody's seen, but keep it simple, stupid. Um, again, simplicity is very important. Uh, dry, I'm sure everybody's heard this, don't repeat yourself. Uh, so if you've got code that you've used in one place and you find yourself needing to use it somewhere else, don't copy the code. Uh, this is the number one sin that I think beginner developers make for sure, is that they're just quick to copy code and move it around. Uh, but even as a more advanced developer, it's uh, tempting that you've got some sort of package or module of things you put together. Maybe it's a plugin or something, and instead of putting it in a repo and then reusing it and versioning it, uh, you find yourself just copying it over. And then on the next project, you copy it over, and then what you end up with is you fix the bug on this project and fix a different bug on that project, and you get ready to start another project, and now you've got three copies of the code. Some have bug fixes here, some have bug fixes there. Now you don't know what you fix where, and so now you're using outdated code on a client site. So making sure that you standardize how and where you put that stuff is important. Uh, YAGNI, yet another, uh, which is not what it stands for, uh, yet another uh, uh, problem that we run into. YAGNI stands for you ain't gonna need it. Uh, so another kind of mortal sin that we all make is trying to be creative geniuses and write code that you know the client's gonna want, but they haven't asked for it yet. Um, and so, you know, it ends up being one of those things where you, you, you implement it and it's a, it sounds like a great idea and it sounds like you're thinking ahead and being smart, uh, but 99% of the time, uh, they come back and they say they want something similar, but it's totally different. And so all the code you wrote is not useful or maybe they didn't need it, and then you wrote all this code, but now your next change means that you have to actually change this code that's not being used, uh, or some other developer has to come in and change this code that's not being used, and they don't understand what it's for because it's not being used. Uh, so all it does is add more confusion than uh, help. So anytime you add stuff like that, especially if there's multiple people on the team, um, you're just increasing the chance of a misunderstanding and you want to make sure that you obviously keep it simple and don't do that. So we'll run through a few coding principles here. Um, so this one is the single responsibility principle, which basically says that software entities should have only a single responsibility and should avoid side effects, which basically means, for example, uh, if you're looking at a system as a whole, you should be able to uh, clearly identify sections of uh, responsibility, right? So if we look kind of in a more classic, uh, you know, here's the user interface, uh, I have some business logic that kind of works in between, and then we have the database and where all the information gets stored. Uh, these are all different layers or responsibilities in the system, and they should be separated so that we can keep those apart. Uh, but then as you delve in, you could say, oh, well, within our business logic, we have you know, this, uh, this particular process, that particular process, and then we would want to split out into modules. You know, we want these different processes separate. And then as you delve into the modules, you have classes that handle specific responsibilities. So you want to make sure that you're not putting things in there that don't, aren't coherent. And then, of course, even at the functional level, you want to make sure that you keep those things uh, nice and clean. And when we say side effects, a lot of times, for example, we'll have some specific function or thing that we're trying to call uh, to incur some sort of change, right? So maybe we just wanted to update a meta value in the database. Uh, so we would just want to store a username 
uh, or some sort of ID or something like that. Um, so if we have a function called, you know, save ID, right? We'd expect it to save that ID, but when that ID also happens to uh, cause an email to get sent, then we've caused a side effect. Uh, and so we've, we've put too much responsibility within that particular function. So as you're looking at, at your code, you want to make sure you can identify those clear boundaries uh, for all your code. So then we also have the open and close principle, which basically says the software entities should be open, or open for extension but closed for modification. Basically, WordPress does a really good job of this. Um, you know, WordPress core is, uh, you know, closed for modification. Uh, I mean, some people obviously go in and hack WordPress, which is not a best practice at all, and they'll change files in WordPress core. Um, but in a standard install, right, nobody can actually easily change WordPress core, right? You just get WordPress core, and then we have plugins, and we have themes, and all of these things are separate entities, and they operate on their own. And it's very easy for a plugin to extend WordPress by hooking into all the, the available hooks and uh, things that WordPress provides. But at the same time, um, it's closed for modification. Uh, it's not very easy to externally you know, modify WordPress itself um, outside of the system it provides for you. Um, so obviously, in, when you're writing your own software, you want to make sure that as much as possible, you, you lock it down, but provide reasonable ways for it to be extended. Uh, and of course, what this is going to do is make sure that uh, external plugins or whatever your external entities are can't change your system in such a way that would completely break it, um, which is the main, the main idea. Um, so the key here for all of this is really just modularity. Um, and modularity, of course, applies at many different levels. Um, so it's good to kind of think about it more in the macro and the micro level. Um, but there's a few principles when you're thinking about modularity that you want to consider uh, so that you can make sure that you are properly packaging things. So the first one is decomposability. So it should make reasonable sense that making something into a module is decomposing the problem into smaller pieces, right? Um, we don't want to take something and break it down so small that it no longer makes sense, right? Because um, it's when we do that that it loses all meaning. So we want to make sure that it's easy for us to understand why it would simplify the system if we were to decompose it and pull it into its own module. At the same time, it should make sense that we should be able to compose those modules and put them together. So if it doesn't make sense that this module that we created uh, you know, if there's no easy way to plug it into a system and make, you know, make it easy to add that feature or thing on and then have this, uh, you know, be able to plug and play like Legos, all these pieces, if, you, if the module you created, well, maybe it makes business sense that it would simplify some logic or something, but it doesn't, there's no practical way to plug it back in and, and build something uh, or build multiple things with it, then maybe it's not right that we put it into a module. So both of those are two rules that you want to kind of look at when you're trying to figure out what should go in a module and what shouldn't. <clears throat> and the other is understandability, right? So the whole idea behind modularizing, well, not the whole idea. There's many ideas behind it. Um, but basically, you want to make sure that it's, you're making things easier to understand. Uh, one of the biggest enemies, I guess, of a developer is going into a system and having to uh, delve through 15, 30 files, uh, you know, navigate several directory structures, figure out what this class is and what that class is, and then realize that the breadth of the system and the way that it interacts with all the pieces is uh, very expansive and that you can't solve your current problem without understanding and keeping in your mind all of those pieces at the same time. So you want to make sure that when you're creating the module, if there is a problem, it should be very clear that it's very likely this module, and if I could just wrap my head around this one module, then I can understand and get a better idea of what's going on and how to fix it. And the other one is continuity, right? So after you've created a module, continuity is essentially the idea behind 
Uh, if I do have a problem, right, some bug does come up, and I need to go solve it, um, is it broken down in such a way that when I do go to solve it, I really only have to, to edit or fix one particular module, right? So again, same idea. If you have to touch a whole bunch of different modules to solve a problem, then it's very possible that you haven't properly packaged things, you haven't properly modularized. So you want to make sure that, you know, if you realize you have a database problem, you shouldn't have to touch uh, anything except your database module. Uh, and it shouldn't bubble up into all the other modules and cause you to have to make changes. There shouldn't be such heavy dependencies between the pieces that, you know, one module breaks another and so on. Uh, which comes to the next point, which is protection, right? So protection basically is saying that if you do have a problem, some sort of abnormality during runtime, uh, that essentially um, that error or runtime issue stays contained within the module and doesn't cause all the other modules to break and go berserk, right? Uh, so you should have some sort of error checking, some, something to contain the, the issue to that module and to keep it from, you know, bubbling up or out, per se. Um, so, as we can see, modularity is important, and kind of these five rules here of decomposability, composability, being able to take it apart, put it back together, and it still works, um, then you're good. Uh, again, the whole goal of simplicity, making sure that you can understand what the module's doing, how it works, how it interacts with other pieces. Um, so, obviously, we've talked about what, what it makes sense, what makes sense to go into a module, but at the same time you also have to consider how the modules themselves communicate. Um, so you want to make sure that you expose reasonable APIs within your module, uh, and nothing more than should be, right? Uh, it shouldn't be necessary for module A to know uh, about all the internals of module B. It only needs to know the things that module B makes public. So if I'm trying to create a um, for example, a WordPress uh, post expiration module, then I don't need you know, other pieces to know about all the cron jobs that are set up or uh, you know, all these different pieces. I only need to know like set an expiration on this post or unset an expiration on this post and that's your public API. That's the only thing that any other module or piece would need to know about. And if there's some sort of error, then you know, those functions should give you an error, the module that's using it should be able to detect that, and you know, then your errors stay contained. So, um, so then we have the reuse and release principle. So basically what this is saying is that only components that are released through a tracking system can be effectively reused, right? So the idea behind the Lego is you have blocks, and you put those pieces together, um, and you can take them apart, and you can use them again, right? Um, with software, we package things up, we, you know, we have a plug-in and we re release it. And because we release it, other people can use it, or we can use it again and again on other sites. If we don't have a method of releasing it and tracking it, which uh, when, you, when I say tracking, really think more about semantic versioning, some sort of versioning system, uh, you know, where we have version one of a plug-in, version two of a plug-in, uh, that kind of thing. So if you don't have some system of tracking and releasing, then there's really no useful way to reuse that code because your only way of actually using it would then be to resort to copying and pasting, which as we know is just going to lead to you copying and pasting more, changing some things, and then not knowing what code to use. Whereas if you track that code and you release it through a system, then you can have one copy of the code you can use version one here and version one here, and then you can fix bug in version one, and you make version 1.0.1 or whatever it is. And then over here, you can actually update the version, and now you have all your stuff running the same code. Um, so it's important principle, and this is why we have things like Composer and NPM. Uh, so Composer, if you use PHP, uh, is a wonderful tool. If you're not familiar with it, you should look it up. Um, it has a lot of uh, the same features if you're familiar with NPM, where essentially there is a, uh, a repository of 
code that you can use uh, that other people have released. And you can simply run composer uh, require some, some package of code, and that will get pulled into your project. And then you could start coding and writing against that code and kind of gluing all the pieces together. Um, and of course, you can release your own packages as well so that you can then you know, release and reuse your code through some sort of track system. Uh, and so just like that, you also have NPM. So if you have JavaScript packages and things like that, you can do the same. Uh, if you have CSS even, uh, there's uh, uh, remind me. Bower, yes, that's the thing. Um, so yeah, so all these different tools that are available so you can release and track and, and reuse your code. Uh, even, even if you're not using these tools, just a simple repository where you can tag versions is going to do the trick, but you have to have some system for doing that. So, uh, so there's a few resources I'd recommend you, che you check out. Obviously, I've been addressing more kind of the higher level, um, you know, why and how of, of packaging things and not the specific design patterns or things like that that you might actually implement in your code. But it's important uh, to actually realize that, you know, above just knowing the syntax and the language and, you know, conditionals and, you know, all those functions that exist in the language, uh, there are also design patterns which are uh, widely accepted as a kind of best practice uh, for, you know, designing and, and putting these systems together, um, even within the context of a package or a module that you might release, um, you know, structuring your code even better. Uh, Sourcemaking.com is an excellent source, uh, resource. It basically uh, will show you a whole bunch of design patterns as well as anti-patterns, so things that you should avoid doing or kind of code smells that you would uh, find in your code uh, and to kind of give you a better feel for you know, maybe what you're doing right and, you know, what could be improved. Um, and they also have, um, so I think most of their examples, they have a number of different languages that they give the actual code examples in. They have PHP, Python, Java, uh, Delphi, a few others. But they don't do JavaScript examples, so I'm putting a uh, JavaScript uh, design patterns uh, reference there so you can kind of see some examples if you're more on the JavaScript side of things. Um, and then there's four books here that I recommend uh, everybody check out. Uh, Clean Code by Robert Martin uh, is a great book. It talks a lot about, uh, you know, naming conventions and, uh, you know, all the, all the things that really just kind of make your code nice and crisp. Uh, and then Code Simplicity uh, is a book. Um, it's a small book, so if, you, if, you, if you're not a big reader, uh, I'd recommend you get, start with that one. It's, uh, it's not very thick, but it's uh, very straight to the point and really illustrates uh, a lot, some of the concepts that I've been talking about here, uh, as well as additional things. Um, and essentially, this guy was on the uh, Mozilla project, I believe. Uh, and so, you know, it got to a point where uh, developers were just, you know, it was like a revolving door. They'd hire somebody, somebody would come in, they'd be like, yes, I'm going to work on this, and then they'd see the code and they'd just leave, right? Uh, it's hard to maintain. It was just such a beast that it got to that point where, you know, they couldn't keep developers on the project at all. Uh, and so he was able to come in and really just focus on simplifying, simplifying, simplifying till they get to a point where it's actually easy to maintain, or at least moderately easy to maintain again, uh, instead of just this behemoth. Um, and then this uh, refactoring book, Robert Fowler. Uh, so if you have existing projects and you do need to go through that process of simplifying and kind of breaking things down and just cleaning up old code, uh, that's a great book. Uh, and then another one, uh, PHP Design Patterns. It's kind of one of the books that I read that kind of familiarized me with the concept of design patterns in general. Uh, and obviously the examples don't just apply to PHP. Um, there's many languages. The, the patterns are not language specific. Usually if there's a pattern, you can figure out a way to implement it in whatever language you're working in. Um, so all of those are excellent resources and I recommend that you check those out. And I think we have about 10 minutes left or so. And so if we got questions, yes. So 
all the agents and programs and all that have you, and you've got your own custom code. Do you think that the work you're doing, let's say if it's like custom client work, for instance, do you think that, that belongs in their own separate repos and that you would install those pieces separately? Or, you know, how, basically, how's your Git mail file? Right, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so for the video, uh, it's a long question. I'm going to do it word for word. Here we go. Now, <laughs> uh, yeah, so in general, the question is, uh, you know, with all the bits and pieces that you can release as packages, uh, you know, how does all that come together in an actual project, essentially, so that you're, when you're trying to version control things and, and get ignore things, uh, what actually ends up in the project, you know, especially particularly pertaining to custom client code, right? Um, and so what I found in the beginning of my development is that I would try to modularize, uh, but I would miss a lot of opportunities to do so because I just, you know, you kind of have to train yourself after a while to, to learn how to package things. And this is slightly off topic, but, uh, <laughs> um, but really, really, I think this is a, a you know, it hits home to me because I talk about modularity and a lot of people are like, oh yeah, yeah, I know that's important. Uh, but, but no, no, really, <laughs> modularity is important. Um, but yeah, so a lot of um, what I do, I, anything generally, anything that is in uh, versioned via Composer or NPM or any of these other tools, it's obviously third-party code, even if you wrote it, right? Like you don't want to physically change code that you have versioned in some system somewhere on a client and not push that back and then update your version in that project, right? So it's important that you just kind of get ignore all those things so that that the code doesn't actually live in the repo so that nobody can actually change it there. And that prevents, particularly when you're on a team, other people coming in and actually being able to push that code to the repo and not follow best practices. So. Um, so that's important. Uh, Client-specific code, particularly with WordPress, if it's a theme uh, and it's design-focused, uh, it all goes in the theme. I always try to have a client plugin, essentially, that's specific to the client. And we in whatever custom code or kind of glue for all those other pieces uh, goes in there. Um, so that's kind of the way that I usually do it. So as far as a WordPress project, we're looking at you know, WordPress is in its own directory. It's pulled in probably via Composer. You've got, you know, plugins and themes that can be pulled down from W packages and pulled in. You've got, uh, I've, I've got a number of custom modules that I've created for WordPress that I usually will pull in, um, most likely into the, the plugin that I write for the client. And then uh, from there, yeah, anything you do beyond that is, which should be relatively small amount generally, uh, goes in the repo. So uh, there are times where sometimes it does make sense to commit the vendor directory, depending on deployment processes and just simplicity for deployment. But as a best practice, keeping that out keeps people from, especially on a team, from pushing things they shouldn't push. So yeah. Any other questions? Assuming I properly addressed that one. So. <laughs> Modularity is easy, right? So, <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I'll, uh, I'm always happy to talk about it. So I'll be at the after party or the Bluehost booth tomorrow or wherever. So feel free to catch me and ask questions or chat or whatever. But, uh, um, yeah, so I guess we'll just finish a few minutes early. But uh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>